Hey, this is George. Hey, this is Fred. Real talk with George and Frazier. Going on, brother. How are you? Much, man. Man, you heard the latest news going on, man. Wait, hold on. You got a lot of background noise. Oh, I'm on the phone. Yeah. Here you go. <laughs> hey, girl. Like, uh, I should hear. So, check that one. But, can you better now? A little better? I can hear you better now. Okay. No, I'm saying. The very final was talking about super teams. Now the biggest thing now NBA is super team. Now everybody wants super team now. Everybody chasing LeBron. And you know what's funny? LeBron ain't chasing nobody. That's a sad thing about it. He's not chasing anybody anymore. Well, you know, look, the NBA has suffered from that for a long time. You know, if you look at Major League Baseball and what George Steinbrenner did with the New York Yankees at a time, yeah. he didn't mind spending money. He spent money to get the players that he needed to bring the championships to New York. And the reason why I'm saying that is because he knew that just from merchandising, yep. marketing, ticket sales, everything that had to do with Yankees, he was going to make his money back. He knew it. Is you that what I'm saying? Whereas you have a lot of NBA players that are, and owners that are just strictly um, are strictly on just the whole thing of uh, their budgets, what we're playing people, who this, that, and the third, that they're not focused. And now you're starting to have players like LeBron James. You're starting to have yep. players like Kawhi Leonard. You're starting to have players like KD. They're like, look, we are not only franchise players. We are championship players. We can go to teams and help them win championships. Exactly. And it's a whole new dynamic now in the NBA because of that. Exactly. You know? Totally agree. But my thing is, too, though, it still boils down to chemistry. I can have a thousand all stars, but they can't play together. That's a waste of time and money. I mean, let's take the example. The Redskins, the Redskins tried it. You on paper, the Redskins had a championship team. They couldn't even make the playoffs, you know? And I'm going to say, as far as the other teams, the Clippers did the same thing. I mean, come on, you had a, everybody on the team. Yeah, everybody had a car. We had car. We recruited everybody, even the big men. You could not get past the second round of playoffs. And then you live in Milwaukee. Milwaukee got one star, but he got a good group around him, but he can't get past that first hump. You see what I'm saying? So, and everybody should try to read the same chemistry he had. What they fell understand was he was not playing them. He was having fun. He was playing like he was playing a playground. I see you. I meet you. They play. You know, and it's, come on. They think about it. Anytime you throw a ball up and don't even look where the ball is going and got right. you to go dunk it, that's not going to chemistry. That, that's a bond. That's a bond. Now. You know? So you can't right. beat that. You can't beat that with nothing in the world. And that's right. what they're searching for. That's what for a super team, they just that one chemistry that can actually put them over the hump. And look, the Knicks, I love them. On paper, the squad look really good. But they be real about it. If LeBron can have a team back healthy, they think beat them. Oh, yeah. Come on, LeBron play everything. The people want to understand this, He's not just a one position player. He does what it takes to win. And if you have a player like that, people feed up that. They could they actually corral with that and bond with that. And now you make them better. So right. that's what you can I love Kyrie, he can't do that. KD can't do that. You know? Hardy, he proved he can't do that in Houston. He proved <laughs> I'm just saying. The man, everybody he put on there, he couldn't want attention anymore. So I'm gonna say that. I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave on that point. That's it. <laughs> well, I definitely agree with you, but you know, look, we got to see. We definitely got to see. Definitely. That being said, we're going to transition to our show today. Uh, know, yeah, we, got we, have a, we, we have an author with us. You know, I'm close to my heart being an author myself. We have Mrs. Pauline Tanner. Am I saying your name correctly? Hey. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Hi, guys. Cool. See Welcome you. to Real hey. Talk. Nice to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. <laughs> Absolutely. So tell the listeners and the fans a little bit about yourself and your new book that you have out and what you're about. Yeah, sure. So I'm about quite a few things. So I um, I have a company called Grant Tree where we get government funding for startups and scale-ups for research and development. It's a company of over 50 people now. I built it up from uh, zero over the last 10 years. I am also a seed uh, angel investor, so I invest uh, little bits and pieces in uh, innovative startups. And yeah, I and during the day I'm a businesswoman. At night I'm a burlesque showgirl. So uh, <laughs> 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 um, the book is called 
Yeah, yeah, thanks. The book is called Laid Bear, What the Business Leader Learned from the Stripper. And in the book, I talk about what my professional persona has learned from my Facebook, uh, Facebook, from my, from, uh, from my um, burlesque persona and vice versa. And I kind of share some lessons on leadership and business. Nice. All right. I have a quick question for you. Do you violate your own social media policy? Huh? Do you violate your own social media policy? <laughs> what do you mean by that? In the United States, we have social media policies now that uh, entertainers and businesses and everybody has. So they want to make sure that their businesses are kind of, uh, how do I say this? PC, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Come on, for you. So tell about the book. Tell what inspired you to write the book. I mean, you did so many good things. You got life full of extraordinary achievements. Like what made you start right. down and we write a book? So uh, I never thought I would write a book, but a few people told me you should write a book. And I was like, uh, really? I'm not sure about it. So it was, um, <laughs> it was just a kind of one of those lovely synchronicities where a few of my friends told me around about the same time. And there was one lunch with one friend where she told me, listen, you should just you should just do it. There's definitely a book in there's definitely a story there. You definitely have a book in you. And I just came home and I opened up the Google Doc and it just started pouring out of me. It was it was amazing. I love the creative process around it. It was so satisfying. Nice. nice. So what were some of the things that you can share with us that you've learned? Sure. So I share, I learned, and that's both as a burlesque girl and as an entrepreneur, that it's okay. It's more than okay to stand out. That, you know, as a burlesque um, showgirl, the more ridiculous your costume, the more ridiculous your makeup, the more mm, attention you will attract. And similar as an entrepreneur, it's important to have the courage and the motivation to be able to be different and to not be afraid to piss some people off. So if you're doing something truly disruptive, you will at some stage piss some people off and it's been yeah. it's super important to be okay with that. So I learned that. I also learned to be a better leader, I would say. So I learned the power of just being as opposed to doing, pausing as opposed to action. So I kind of developed my feminine leadership side a little bit more. So I believe we all have a feminine and masculine side to our leadership. So for me, yeah. it really performing taught me kind of fasting more in the process, being in the moment, um, and just really surrendering to what is happening as opposed to con constantly trying to change and influence things. Right. True. Absolutely. And true. So, so for venture capitalists, um, do you look for certain areas of business? Because I know some companies will be like, we're only tech companies. Some companies will say we're only agriculture companies. Some companies will say, you know, we're only real estate companies. What do you look for when you're looking to invest or is it just setting the foundation to help small businesses or businesses out? Sure. So I'm not a VC really. I'm more of a kind of small angel investor. And I always I always invest in tech companies so that there needs to be technology, strong technology components to what they're doing just because that's my background and that's my network. Um, and it's typically software platforms, although I have invested in hardware as well. And I'm always looking for strong teams and um, good commercial potential. So there needs to be quite a lot of commercial hunger on the team as opposed to, um, you know, just focus around how to build the product and what that product is going to look like. It's really important uh, for me to see that the team will be able to sell what they're doing and then it's imp that it's important to them to sell what they're doing. Right. Nice. Okay. I got a good question for you. I don't know, as an entertainer, like sometimes it used to encourage you, you that ability, it gives that courage to do what you don't want, you don't do what people, you don't care what nobody think about you. It gives you that extra um mm. and enthusiasm. Like what part of like, each part of your life you've been through, like the entertainer slash angel investor, now Arthur, like what parts of that, like, can't one and make it even better to a throw like basically say like be writing a book like what part of entertainment life helped you inspire you what part of being an angel vector inspired you to write the book sure so i think 
Um, I'm a better entertainer because I'm a business person as well. So I've got that organizational skills and I'm quite serious about what, what I do in terms of like wanting to achieve my goals. So because of that, I'm a stronger performer and I'm a better leader because I've performed on stages in different clubs. So I'm able to um, be okay with being in the center of attention. I'm able to hold that attention. At the same time, I I don't have to be in charge and control all the time. I'm, I'm better at being able to surrender and accept what the situation is bringing. Um, there's kind of ways, it definitely influenced me both ways. So I became a better leader on one hand and I became a better performer on the other. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Well, let me ask you, are you an extrovert or an introvert? A bit of both. I think I'm mostly an extrovert, but I think I'm a bit of both, definitely. Okay. No, the reason why I ask is because I'm an introvert by nature, but mm -hmm. because I'm a martial arts instructor and I do a lot of other things, yeah. those, those, um, those jobs and those things that I do make me an introvert. Like, I'm definitely afraid of public speaking. But the moment that I have to speak publicly I, right now, you know, and you're very good. So, well, the moment right. I have to speak, you know, I become that martial arts instructor. So it's my time. You're getting things from me. And that takes away the fear of speaking publicly because now I'm the authority. You know, there's something that I have to get to you. So that's my little trick that I use to get past that little fear of public speaking. You know, at that particular time, no, you're the instructor. You have to be able to translate what you want to say to them confidently, you know, exactly. that's what I, that's what I've been able to use. What are some of the tools that you've been able to use to speak publicly and grow and learn and communicate some of the messages that you have to get off in your leadership positions? I think just really trusting myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting better and better at trusting myself and just um, having that belief in myself that mm -hmm. even when I have lower days or, you know, I'm not as confident as I normally am. I know that I have value to bring, and that's important to me. I know that I can, um, and I have inspired people in the past. So just looking at my track record helps. Um, just also surrounding myself with my support network really helps. So people that believe in me and champion me. That's, right. um, that's really important. So I always there's always someone I can call. There's quite a few friends that I'm speaking to regularly who really believe in me and help me get back on the right track if I'm feeling less confident on a given day. So support network is key. And uh, yeah, I have a therapist. I have a coach. I um, use, I have a personal trainer. There's quite a few people that I use as a form of investment in myself. Right. To right you know, be on the right track with my mental health, with my physical health. It's very important to me. So I really don't save money on that. Yeah. That, okay. that's, good. that's good to say because me, I, I had a first time I put a speaking problem. First time I was scared. I was petrified. <laughs> I thought people looking like, and you the old saying back in the old days, you tell you, you picture some picture everybody a certain way. It's be easier to do it. You know what the old saying? It never worked. It never worked for me at all. <laughs> you can say oh, it, Trash. <laughs> oh, well, you can picture everybody naked. And you say, you can picture something like this. Oh, okay, now you talk to them. Like, I had mentors who actually coached me through that steps and stuff like that on how to do it. Like, who are some of your mentors, each phases of your life that inspires you to do certain things, entertainment, and angel investing, and now being an author? Like, what are some of your mentors? Right. Who you uh, yeah, so there are people in my network that I really look up to, and um, I'm also a spiritual person, so there is somebody I just spoke to before this call who I'm going to be reading the Bible with on a regular basis, you know, nice. it's super important for me to have all those things in balance, to have business mentors, but also spiritual mentors, but also people who support me when I'm not at my best with my mental right. health, so it's having kind of a variety of people that you rely on and that support you. It's right. really, really important to me. 
Absolutely. Nice. Can I ask you um, for your company as far as angel investing? Um, yeah. Do you do it solely as yourself or do you have partners that you use? And um, do you guys raise money and have it like in a, a, a one account or do you raise money for each particular project that you do? So, for instance, do you have like two million dollars sitting in one account to look at these businesses or do you say, OK, we like this. We're going to raise money for this particular business every time we look at a new business. How does your company work? Yeah, so my company, Grant Tree, we work on government grants, and there we don't hold any money. We just apply on behalf of our clients for funds. Okay. So we don't, you know, sometimes we do business to business loans, and there we, you know, have a small pot of cash available in our company, which we can use to do those, execute those loans. When it comes to my angel investing, I've got a yeah, relatively modest. Um, amount that I can invest in startups every mm -hmm. year and I'm also looking to hopefully get involved in a um, in a startup fund where there will be a much bigger amount which, that we play with uh, that we can invest in startups so yeah I don't think it would be sustainable to like raise every time you want to invest in a startup raise a small amount of money you need to have access to a bigger pot right sure. absolutely well, just saying, like, what are some of the key things you look for when you're actually trying to make an investment with the startup? Because doing being a startup, sometimes they're not, they've been mature a while. They were very first started a year. Sometimes you're less than that. Like, what are some of your criteria you look for in a startup you want to invest in? Right. So, like I said before, the team is very important to me. Um, the fact that they're working together well, that they can overcome adversity, that they have all the skills on their team that they're going to need um, to um, take on the challenge, that they are the right fit for the market that they're working, operating within. That's very important. Um, and the commercial acumen, commercial hunger. So ideally, there is some commercial traction already. And, and if there is not, then at least I can see that the team is really committed to um, being commercially successful with their product. So it's not just mostly technical expertise and being interested in the technical side of things, but they have strong kind of set of skills on the commercial side of things as well. Right. Mm -hmm. How many um, applications do you get uh, a year for businesses? Because here in the yeah. United States, you know, we have either the small business uh, administration that does a lot of that work for us where we can go for loans. Um, but a lot of private companies now have started to walk into this particular market because um, as interest rates go down or go up, investors are really looking for yields on their money. So some investors don't want to do anything unless they can successfully get at least a guaranteed 10 percent on their money. And so they look into the private market for things of that nature. Um, how does that work in the UK per se? Is it like the same process or is it just something a little bit easier? In terms of what? Um, pitching yes. for money? Yes, yes, pitching for money, absolutely. Um, I would say it's probably harder in the UK because there is less, a bit less appetite for risk. Okay. And there is just less VCs and angels than, than they are, there are in the US. So um, I've heard from so many entrepreneurs that they're considering going to the U U.S. to raise because there's just more money available. So if anything, it's probably a bit harder, to be honest. How do you navigate that then? Uh, you know, because it's more competitive. I'm just trying to have our listeners, you know, get a, a gauge as to, you know, the markets and how these things work, because it could be very defeating if, you know, you're if let's say there's a top 100 and you're you know you're the top 25 you know you just always are getting bumped because of, you know there's 24 people ahead of you that the quote unquote business industry will look at first i think you just have to be really competitive so you you need to be really good at what you do and you have to be very well presented so you have to have a slick professionally done pitch deck and you need to be prepared to network with investors, to get to know them personally, all ask for introductions so that you don't just cold email them. So it's 
yeah, so it's really important that you have that stamina to keep going to take rejection multiple times um, and you're really, really well, well presented and you stand out from the rest. That's really right. important. Right, right, right. So I'm going to part of the risk factor because I know like in the UK, in the United States, it's different. Other countries are different. Especially when the time you're putting the packages together with the analysis, numbers, and everything together. Like how important is, hey, you, if you want to invest outside of the UK and the person comes to you and pitching you and his numbers are a little off, but he has a very good product that has potential to mm -hmm. a particular niche of a target market that can be good. How do you feel about investing in that company? Would you take a chance on it or would you kind of pass on it? That depends. I'll probably connect them with someone in my network who can help them improve on the financial forecast. Uh, so somebody who can help right. rev up their mm. financials so they look good. Yeah, but I mostly invest based on my relationship with the founders not the financials, because in the very early stages, the financials are, you know, yeah. they're, they're going to be way off anyway. Yeah. So so uh, for me, it's mostly my relationship with the founders, how I know them, knowing their resilience, how committed they are to the idea. Um, and, yeah, the idea of being good is also something that counts. For sure. sure. That is true. Right. That's very good to say, because most angel investors don't have that personal relationship with the company they're trying to invest in. But Jordan just look at numbers. And right. it's very good to hear that a person actually believes, they believe in the person, the person, and the code, and they connect and build a relationship with a person when they're investing. That's a very good niche because now that person also obligated not to fail you or make sure he has more, how you say, more skin, skin in the game, more skin, skin in the game. game. Cause he don't want to let you down. So he like, he has more info with you. So like, what do you say? Like some people like, your professions don't have the same niche you have. Like, how do you navigate through that? Because you are in the majority male field. So how do you manage to navigate to being a female angel investor? Is that a differential or is it still the same, especially in the UK? Uh, so are you saying, um, does it make a difference in somebody, if somebody yeah. is? If you're a female, the most, most angel investors are usually males. There are very few female angel investors yeah. that I've seen. So how do you navigate through that in a male dominant field? Pretty much. Yeah. In other words, do you feel like it's a crutch? Do you, do you feel like you, you are set back slightly when they see a female walk through the door as opposed to a male? Yeah, they can be. And that can be a very good thing because it surprises them. Uh, so um, yes, it. there are quite a few angel business investors um, who are female and that's fine. It's just, you know, it's just part of it. And uh, I guess I learned to navigate male dominated industries ever since I started working in, in the field of technology. Mm -hmm. So it's um, something that, um, yeah, something that's actually normal and I don't even think about it anymore. <laughs> nice. Nice. So, that's all right. We know you have to go. We thank you for taking the time for being with us. I think it's uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's five really, six o'clock in the UK. And all, all, the, all the best of luck with what you're doing. It's uh, sounds great. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you on. It's a much pleasure to have you. And your experience is is amazing. Can you give some um? Are our listeners some tips in the event they want to start an angel investing type business or fund? Yes, of course. So um, firstly, make sure that you only invest money that you can afford to lose. So don't invest money That's that right. you can't right. afford to lose. It's very, very important because statistically speaking, 90% 90, 90 of your investment is going to disappear. Um, so you need to be okay with that. Um, and secondly, just learn from the best. So I, I started off and I'm still at the beginning of my journey as an investor, investing alongside people who have way more experience and who really understand, um, the industries that I'm investing in. And I need to have some knowledge of the space where I play. So I need to, I, I have quite a lot of clients in my company grant tree that are software platform companies. So um, 
you know, I have some knowledge of those industries and I can maybe advise and be of use to those entrepreneurs that are investing in this space. Right. So, yeah, that would be another piece of advice. Absolutely. Right. So tell everybody where you can find you on social media. They want to reach out to you. Or possibly yeah, sure. To sure. So it's at Paulina Turner on uh, Instagram, Twitter and Clubhouse. And you can find my page, Paulina Tenner, as well on Facebook. So it's quite yeah. easy to find me. Don't forget about your book. Where do you get your book at? Don't forget about your book. Where can you find your book? Yes. So it's not out yet. But if you go to my website, paulinatenner.com, uh, you can sign up to my newsletter and I'll keep you updated. Nice. Great. Listen, we thank you for being on the show and taking the time. Yeah, out it's a pleasure, sure. guys. Best of luck to you, honestly. Thank, thank you so you. much. Pleasure. Bye. Okay. Cheers. Bye, -bye now. Bye. Right now, <laughs> great interview. Wow, I told you, no, not easy. Man. Definitely not easy. It's harder in the UK uh, than it is in the United States to raise money. I guess if you're looking at, uh, you know, population and you know economic uh, GDP, you know what we basically yeah. spend. The United States is a 15 trillion dollar year economy. The United Kingdom is not. Exactly. You know, so it's just it's just more of a challenge. But I'm glad to see that she's out there doing it. I'm glad to see she's taking the bull by the horns. I don't that's think she got the whole social media policy thing, but that's quite all right. That's a, that's an American thing. <laughs> um, Ain't nobody do social media. The UK is everything good. It's it's free spirit there. It's, I mean, we have to look at some of the pages in the UK versus some of the pages in the United States. They're totally different. The format totally different. The content totally different. You know, that's true. so that's true. But look, it's definitely all good, man. I'm glad that she's actually out there and she's actually doing it. You know, because um, it's very easy not to do something for whatever reason. Yeah, you know, it's very easy to take the comfort road. But being able to establish those businesses, being able to keep that economic engine going and that supply going, is really what builds economies. You know, think about it. If somebody didn't take a chance on Google, will we have Google? Exactly. Somebody didn't take a chance on Facebook. Everything that went with Facebook, will we have Facebook? Exactly. You know what I mean? Which if somebody didn't take a chance on Bitcoin, will we have Bitcoin? Exactly. You see exactly. What I mean? And look at this. Look at MySpace. Some of the ones who started out, as she said, it never sent disappeared over time. Because as you say, that particular niche goes away very quickly or it improves. Right. You, well, MySpace was good, but when Facebook came out, then you have all the other sites came out. There's a little bit better, all more features. He was kind of weed away from him more. My was just business. Oh, yeah. I mean, but you got to think about it, too. You know, whenever you're the first, you're the first to be looked at. You're the first to be praised and you're the first to be destroyed. Because when you're the first, everybody goes, oh, yay, great. It's out. Then they, exactly. then they say everything that's wrong with your business. It and, is, exactly. and if somebody who has the same ideal type of business that you have, they just go, OK, well, that major one doesn't have this. So now I'm going to adjust my platform for all the things that we that they don't have and I'm going to launch. Exactly. And that's how a lot of businesses, a lot of businesses start their businesses. For instance, people didn't understand search in the beginning or how powerful search was going to be. Now yep. search is the dynamic platform that's out there for anything that you want to do from who you talk to on your phone to yep. what you look at on the Internet. It's the algorithm is search based. And exactly. if people didn't take the the people didn't take search seriously, and like I said, a company like Google, I mean, think about it. AOL didn't know what, how powerful search was. They were just happy yeah. to be on the internet. You see, it's what I mean? a, it was a little it was happy. Yeah, but, you know, went that little United States though. So that's have a wonderful thing. If you're the first in something, they give you seven years to perfect it before you're allowed to lease it out, or somebody get back and get into your market. So right. my thing is too. Some companies grow with them seven years. Some companies stay the same because you know what? Hey, after I'm good, it doesn't need to be changed. You know what I'm talking about? Like Toys R did it. Uh, Siri did it for a while. Yeah. Like they, they had a niche. And right. instead of proving in that niche, which everybody know, Siri proved with the catalog. That was the best thing ever came out was his catalog. You Until know? the internet came and squashed it. Why would we exactly. need a catalog now when we can search it online? Exactly. But instead of them saying, you know what? How about make our catalog digital now? So people, so even more people can reach out to it, make it more international. So he said, "Well, international." They you tried, know? and then so, Amazon came along and was like, "We're not exactly. just selling books; we selling everything." It took over the exactly. world. Exactly. Definitely they, all good. We made eBay too. When eBay came out, they used to ask stuff. You don't want to give it 
Oh, great version of garage sales. I'm just saying. <laughs> so it's definitely it awesome. So but listen, know? we appreciate, we definitely appreciate Paulina for coming on and sharing her experience. And we definitely uh, um, thank, thank you all for listening in. You know, these little 30 minute shows with these guests are really starting to take off and get a little bit of traction for us. So we may just stick to that format. We don't know yet, but um, we definitely appreciate everybody for checking in and well, uh, checking us out. Hey, this was George. Hey, this is Fred. And that was Real Talk with George and Fraser. Peace. Peace.